getting it if you took the metro. Uh, you and Green, did you drive in? Are you going to drive in tomorrow? Come get this because you'll need it. Because your ice should be covered in your car should be covered in ice in the morning because it is supposed to snow a lot tonight. Uh, no, this one's a little sharp. I don't want to throw that. <laughs> what? Well, okay, the weather has changed. Big surprise. Well, big surprise. <laughs> the weather has changed for Shmukon again. Uh, it's, st it's still going to snow because it it's still Shmukon. And Shmukon can't exist without snow. So how many of you going to drink tonight? So... Don't just drink alcohol, please drink some water, so heads Ooh. up. All right, and then the last giveaway that I ha uh, have, uh, University of Washington uh, put together an amazing game to teach people that know nothing about hacking a lot about what we do. So reverse engineering, uh, the operation. So this is not going to go to somebody that doesn't know what we're doing. It's going to go to somebody that has the most number of kids. Something true, true to my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, so most number of kids. We'll start with uh, two. All right. I see somebody with three. Somebody with more than three. You in the back. You have four. What are their ages? Oh, that sounds there's, plausible. There's seven over here. Wait, who's got seven? They don't. Uh. No, all right. You with the f come come get the control hack again. University of Washington. This is an amazing game. Uh, we want to teach the next generation to be uh, hackers just like us. Maybe uh, hopefully better than us. Please teach your kids. Um, my ten-year-old absolutely loves that game. So, uh, without further ado, uh, David is going to talk to us about uh, iOS uh, application security. So. Uh, please give a warm well, uh, welcome, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm David Schutz. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as Darth Null. That's the name I kind of use when I hack things. And I'm here to talk about taking care of the data on all of your iStuff. Real quick requisite background slide. I work for Intrepidus Group, and since August of last year, we actually got bought by NCC Group, which is a British company that also owns ISEC Partners and Matsusano. So it's been kind of interesting. Hasn't changed a whole lot, fortunately. Uh, we do an awful lot of mobile app testing, both in the, the applications themselves, but also in looking into the OS itself, the research and stuff like that. We have some guys who do a lot of great stuff with NFC. I primarily focus on iOS things, as you might guess from, from my subject matter. Uh, other people in the company do an awful lot of stuff with Android, including the guy in the room right behind me. So if you get bored here, go there. Um, we also do just about everything else, web app testing, pen testing. And if you're interested in any of that, give us a call because we're hiring. But I'm not here to talk about Intrepidus. I'm here to talk about iStuff. And iStuff looks really cool today. It's, it's iPads, mini iPads, stuff like that. But it started off way up there in the left-hand corner with the Osbournes, which were great, big, ugly, heavy things with like a three-inch CRT and a pair of five and a quarter-inch drives. Um, a lot has changed in the past 20 years. For every one of these devices, though, there tends to be a reasonably predictable adoption curve. First, the geeks get them. They all say, oh, this is fantastic. I love this thing. Technophiles start using them. And then normal people start to use them, just everyday people, college kids, stuff like that. And then it starts to filter into the workplace. You see normal people who happen to also be management start to use them and start to realize, hey, these are good and I want to use it in my, my daily work. And then the nightmare scenario is when the normal people who also happen to be in management happen to be in your management chain. Then the first thing you're going to ask is, is this safe? How can I make it safer? And that's hopefully what we'll be able to help you with. We'll talk a little bit about the high-level threats to your data and some about the general technology that's available on iOS devices, some what's good, some what's bad, some really crazy things you can do against them. And then we'll get into the meat of what I hope will be helpful for people to take back to, to decision makers and stuff so you can actually answer these questions for people. Um, and then finally, when it's all done, there'll still be a little bit of residual risk. You can't lock these down perfect. You'll never get them locked down perfect. What are the things that you just can't do anything about and that's, that's still going to be a problem that you have to, have to keep in mind? So, oh, good. So the way I see it, there's primarily four threats. I mean, there, there's obviously lots of different things, lots of different people that are going to be attacking you. Some of them might be advanced, some of them might be persistent. Never mind. Um, 
but, but primarily I see them as, as four things. You, you could have the user, the authorized user, the owner, the person to whom this device is, has been issued. They use it all the time. They could do something stupid. They could do something stupid accidentally. They could do some, something stupid purposefully. But both of those are significant threats you need to worry about. Then there's also the chance of the device being lost or stolen. That could happen accidentally or it could happen on purpose. The device or its data could be specifically targeted by an outsider. We'll do a quick review of these threats, highlight some simple mitigations for each one, but most of those I'm just highlighting just to show that some of these you'll see repeatedly, and we'll get into details as, as we move forward. So user mistakes. Uh, here I had more in mind the simple things that you could do, just, just accidentally screwing things up. For example, you've got two email accounts on your iPhone, and you bop off something or other to, to somebody and you hit send, and then you realize, wait, that email address didn't look quite right, and you sent the right message to the wrong person from the wrong account, and now all of a sudden your business plan has been leaked to the New York Times. Um, or, or sharing of documents and data. Maybe you, you've got docs on your phone or your iP iPad, and you accidentally post it somewhere else or cross, you know, save, it, save it to the wrong server. Or even just leaving it unlocked. Uh, imagine an executive's iPad sitting in a conference room, and he left it unlocked, and he walked out, and you're the only person there. You're like, hey, what's... What's in his email? And do that real quick and then get out and lock it and you'll never know. There's some ways you can mitigate some of these. You can, you can do some, some uh, dedicated application vaults and we'll talk, definitely talk about those in detail. Uh, but primarily you're going to have different policies, uh, sometimes technical policies, sometimes just procedural policies and there are other kinds of controls you can put on them. But what if the user is bad? What if the user is deliberately trying to do something to get data off the phone? They can, they can sync it to your, to your desktop at home, for example, and, and now you've got everything. Uh, you can also, obviously, if, uh, in a lot of applications, you can send documents out through mail. You can uh, even use specialized applications to connect directly to the device and remove data from it. Some of these you can mitigate to a bit with things like uh, forcing encrypted backups if the user doesn't know what the key is. You can go supervised mode, which is really crazy. Uh, and again, protect the data vaults. None of these are perfect there's probably going to still be, be some ways around these. Simple theft is another, another thing that people worry about, um, and with good reason. Imagine you just leave your, your iPad at a coffee shop or on a plane, and that happens all the time. Uh, strong passcode, protected data vaults, remotely wiping a stolen device, things like that. Those are your typical mitigations you think of when you think of addressing this kind of threat. But of course, a lot of those you can still get around. Somebody who's stolen a device and doesn't want to get wiped, they, they turn it off, they remove the SIM, or they put it into a bag that's, you know, a, a foil line bag so radio signals can't get in. Most of the time, though, if your device has been swiped by somebody at the airport or at Starbucks, they're just going to wipe it and sell it to somebody else. But the final problem is a targeted attack. They know this is your device. They know it's yours. They know what's on it. They know it's very important. They're going to try really hard to get to it. What can they do? If, they, if they're ready to play a long game, they could install malware on the PC at, at your home or at your office. Uh, they might break in and, and try and do things and, and install things on the device. Uh, if they just steal the device outright, they might be able to do some forensic attacks on it. Uh, and again, the mitigations typically passcodes again, data vaults, remote wipe. Uh, again, somebody who's really trying to get it, they're going to make sure the wipe doesn't happen. Best mitigation is don't put dangerous stuff on it. But you can't always get executives to listen to that advice. So as I said, a lot of these threats kind of overlap. And as you saw, a lot of the controls overlap. You see some of them, the passcodes, data vaults, things like that. You see them a lot of places. So we'll get to those uh, after we do a real quick review of, again, some of the, the high-level technologies that are available on, on the I iOS devices. And a lot of these have been explained in very good detail by a lot of other people, so I'm only going to kind of touch the high levels of them. So the good stuff. Sandbox, it's a little technical, but it's a good thing to, to understand that there are kernel level controls on the device that keep applications from accessing data belongs, that belongs to other applications. Uh, isolates every program and certain files and certain uh, I.O. functionality and other, other kinds of uh, technologies. S explicitly groups them together and isolates them from one another. So a program can't have access to another program's data. They can only access things that are made generally available through the OS. Things like your contacts or your uh, photos or, or uh, calendar and stuff like that. It's not quite a multi-level secure system like in SE Linux, but it's close. It's, it uses a lot of the very similar technologies. 
There's also encryption. Starting with the iPhone 3GS and onward, they included hardware level AES-256 encryption on the devices. And this actually encrypts the entire uh, hard disk, the, the flash memory, at a low level. Uh, it's completely transparent to the user, but it is tied to the passcode. It's also tied to a key that's present only on the device and you can't get off the device. There's actually part of the encryption uh, mechanism to derive the key for encrypting the decrypting the disk. It takes the passcode, sends it through some internal magic on the silicon on there, and it combines with data that's on that, and then it spits back out the key, more or less. It's a bit more complicated than that. But the bottom line is that you can't just simply take the memory chips out of an iPad and stick them into another iPad or read it with, with a reader. You, it, you have to have the original device and the passcode in order to read it. In iOS 4, they added the Data Protection API, which is an additional level of encryption you can put on files. And we'll go into some more. Uh, this is definitely one of the, the programming tips that I'll have towards the end. Um, basically, it's a way that you can flag a file to say, this is special, I want it to be encrypted when the key's locked or the device is locked. So what happens is as soon as you lock the device, the keys that were used to encrypt all these protected files is thrown away. It no longer exists in memory. Of course, you're going to have to get those keys back somehow to read them again. So what they do is all those keys are stored in a special key bag, which is itself encrypted again with the passcode. So you lock it, the keys are gone, you unlock it with your passcode, it finds the key bag, decrypts it, now it can read all these protected files again. It's uh, very secure, though, because uh, even, if, even on a jailbroken device, you can sit there you know, in an SSH and you, you look at a file, look at a file, look at a file, lock it, look at a file, look at a file, oh, disk error. I mean, it actually throws a disk error. You can't read the file once it's locked. There are multiple ways, uh, multiple protections that you can flag. Um, the protection complete basically encrypts it as soon as you lock it. End of story. There's protected unless open, which is a special variant of that that uses some public key uh, configuration to actually be able to write encrypted data to the file even when the device is locked. And that's good if you're downloading something long in the background and you have to lock, lock it. Uh, there's also protected until unlock, which means as soon as you boot the device, it's locked. But as soon as you unlock it once, it's available. And there are very similar protections to these for entries in the keychain. There's the application store, which gets a lot of talk and a lot of talk pro and con about the whole walled garden and keeping everything in one place. Uh, but the short of it is that developers, when they, when they want to sell apps to the App Store, they've got to be registered. Apple knows who they are, more or less. They'll, they'll do screening for the application to make sure that, that there's nothing bad in it, nothing insecure, nothing's going to hurt the user, but also nothing that, that breaks Apple's policies. So certainly there's, there's altruistic methods and there's, there's certainly very, uh, whatever the opposite of altru very selfish methods for Apple reasons to do it. But the bottom line is that they end up signing the applications, and if the apps aren't signed, they won't run on the device. And it's a very good way to prevent just malware from getting on there. You know, hey, install this cool thing, and, and you get little pictures of kittens running around your phone while it's sending your contacts off to Russia or something. You don't have those uh, so far. A few things have slipped by. Charlie Miller managed to very famously get something into the App Store, and it got out there. Um, but as far as we know that I'm aware of, nothing really dangerous has got out there yet. Um, certainly something could have and we haven't seen it. That would be well done. But even if something does get through the App Store, get, does get through the reviews, and there's still something dangerous on it, there's still the sandbox level protections on the device that are in place that will protect or limit the damage that it can, can uh, impart on the phone. Now obviously if, there's, if these devices can exploit the vulnerabilities you use for jailbreaking, then some of that goes out the window. But it, you're, you're significantly raising the bar to an attack through this. Most of what you'll do to secure devices will be through configuration changes. And there's, uh, iOS has a way to create configuration profiles that group some of these settings together. Uh, you can restrict things, you can turn off the camera, you can turn off access to the App Store. You can provide known good configurations so you don't have to have all your users following a you know, badly Xerox copy of a thing where they enter their server name for their email and they fat finger it and it takes you an hour to figure out what the heck's going on because you didn't see that part. Um, and they're good for pushing out technical policies, strong passwords, and so on. Even these are not quite perfect. There are some controls, and we'll get into those, that are just not available. And in most cases, the user can still undo these changes. They can still remove a lot of these profiles. And of course, also, how do you do this for an entire enterprise? You certainly don't want to go around and plug in every single iPad and, you know, 1,000 employee enterprise and, and make all those changes. 
which is where the last really good tech that I like comes in is mobile device management. I've done a whole talk on MDM, you can find it if you Google me. Uh, but generally, M MDM manages profiles in a centralized fashion. So you can create your profiles, spit it out to all the devices in your organization, instantly, quote unquote, updating all of your devices to whatever new policy change you've got. You can also remotely install apps, you can lock, unlock the devices, wipe them, things like that. Those are some of the good technologies. Okay, so what are some of the bad things you can do to the technology that's out there? The iOS devices are still generally considered a personal device. Uh, they're aimed at consumers, businesses have really certainly at attached themselves to it, they love them because their people love them. Um, but they're still, even if it's owned by the company, it's still considered a personal device to the person who uses it. It's still kind of their thing. And so there's, there's some things that you just haven't been able to turn off. Apple has always allowed the user to quit the mobile device management, for example. They, they call it sort of a carrot and stick mentality though, so that if you delete yourself from MDM, you also lose whatever MDM installed. So if you use the MDM profile to send out your VPN credentials for the corporate VPN, saying ah, I'm done with your, your big brother controls and you, you wipe off MDM, you also lose the access. Depending on how they push out applications, you can also flag the application to be deleted if the person leaves MDM as well, and that will also delete the data. Uh, but that's not required, that's, that's an option. And of course, if you don't do, do things like that, then the user could simply disenroll from MDM, extract data from the device or jailbreak the device or something and then, then re-enroll with it. Though there's an application called Configurator, Configurator, which came out uh, last spring, which is beginning to change some of this under certain circumstances. There are also some sneaky tricks you can do. Uh, as I said before, there, there's, I think I said before, getting data off of the device through, through desktop software. There's lots of different applications that can basically hook into the iTunes uh, protocol that's used to talk to, to sync applications and data back and forth. It simply needs your passcode. Uh, once you hook up your device to a laptop, launch one of these apps, you can just surf through and say, okay, here's this application, here's the documents folder, here's the file, now I've got it. This is even stuff that isn't advertised to share documents in iTunes. For some applications, you can fire up iTunes, look down at the bottom and say, okay, here's, you know, such and such an application, let's drag in a, a PDF and now it's on there. With these other apps, you can see every application and grab all their data, including preferences, files, and caches and stuff like that that are hidden away. For a while, there was a, an attack you could do, uh, the device firmware upgrade, DFU boot. And basically, you could put the device into a specific special mode that could cause it to pull its, its uh, boot partition, not off of the internal device, but from a USB connection. So people were actually taking legitimate iOS uh, uh, image, disk image, tweak it a little bit, make some changes to it, and install it as a, as a file on your, on your laptop, boot your uh, iPod, iPad, or iPhone, or whatever off of that RAM disk, and then SSH into it, and you have full access to the files through the shell. Now, because you've booted off the external disk, you don't have any of the keys. So if, if something is locked, you can't get at that via the file protections. So you can't at least get those, but you can still get all kinds of other stuff. Also, uh, there's, I talked a little bit about key bags for, for saving all these different keys on the device. And their key bags are stored on the device, but you also have to have a key bag to, to back up to your desktop. If you have a device that has a passcode on it, and you hook it up to iTunes and you try to back it up and it's, and it's locked, the very first time it says, oh, I can't read this, you have to unlock it. Once you unlock it, it sends a copy of that key bag over to the desktop. Then the next time you try to sync, if the device is locked, the desktop says, oh, you're locked, but I've got your keys, sends the keys back to the device, the device can now access the data and send it back over. Depending on the OS, that, those key bags stored on the local machine might not be stored very securely. If your office mate has an iPad and he syncs to his PC and he leaves his machine unlocked, you just slide your chair over, copy the file, stick it on your box, slide back, and the next time he leaves his iPad on his desk when he goes home, you just hook it up to your box and sync it straight to your box. There's also a fairly a, a complicated way you can do something to, to fake responses to the MDM server. Essentially run your own program on a server you control, have your device join that for MDM, then when the company says, hey, I, you've got an iPad, we have to put your iPad in MDM, you say, okay, I'll do that. And then your device doesn't enroll, your proxy, as it were, enrolls for you, it connects to the MDM server, 
but it gives the information that relates to your device. So now when the MDM server sends out messages, it comes to the Apple push notification to your box, to your iPad, which then says, oh, I've got an MDM message, I'll ask the server, which it thinks is you. It asks you, hey, they want to know if you're compliant. You say, oh yeah, and you tell the server, yeah, I'm compliant. Not exactly an easy thing to do, but it's there. The technology does, does support that kind of really, really sneaky trick. I call that a Potemkin attack. Maybe one of, the, one of these days it'll, it'll catch on. The name, not the attack. Anyway, um, jailbreaking, we all know about jailbreaking, probably. Uh, it gives you access to the, to the files on the device directly. It, it's a way to get past all these really cool controls that I talked about. It can disable uh, kernel controls, disables uh, code signing checks, things like that. And they're neat, and certainly the first couple of years that I had an iPhone, I jailbreak them because I was running on T-Mobile and I wanted to run my phone on T-Mobile. I didn't want to go to AT&T. Uh, so it was great, but it isn't necessarily the safest thing to do because again, it's disabling these controls and in order to get there in the first place, you're exploiting bugs. You're exploiting a vulnerability in the iOS to make this happen in the first place. So far, I don't think anybody's found any malicious intent in any of the jailbreaks, but that could certainly happen. Um, some of these jailbreaks are easy, some of them are hard. Uh, jailbreakme.com was a very simple one. You actually surfed a thing and slid a little slider over and it jailbroke your phone while you sat there. Uh, some of the early ones were very complicated. You had to go through all kinds of hoops. The later ones have been easier. Evasion that just came out a few weeks ago, also very easy. Uh, but both Evasion for iOS 6 and Absinthe for iOS 5 took months for those to come out for newer devices. So it's getting a little bit harder to, to jailbreak. And whenever you talk about jailbreaks, especially in a corporate setting, they say, well, how do we stop this? Well, you really can't. Uh, they're, they're looking for bugs, and as long as you can find bugs, people will find a jailbreak. But it is getting harder. The, the two jailbreak me vulnerabilities they were in, I think iOS 3 and iOS 4, they both got patched fast. One of them, I think a patch came out within a week of it being going live on, on the internet. And the newer, device, newer devices have had increased protection. So the DFU boot that I uh, related earlier some of the early uh, jailbreaks d depended upon things like that, boot ROM level exploits. And so newer devices don't have that. So Apple's basically making it harder. The second thing that they'll ask you after saying, can we not, you know, make sure you can't jailbreak, is okay, well, how do we know if it's been jailbroken? We need an app that'll do that. And you really can't do that either. Uh, to detect where the device is jailbroken, you have to say, okay, what's changed? You look for files, you look for try to do things that you're not supposed to be able to do on a normal device, things like that. So you kind of infer whether or not the device has been jailbroken. But there's also software available to spoof those. In Cydia, which is the, uh, essentially the app store for jailbroken devices, there's actually programs in there that hook into the OS at a low level and it recognizes a lot of the common tricks that people will use to detect a jailbroken device. And it will, just like I said before, with, you know, my, my fake MDM server, it'll say, oh, what, why no, I'm not jailbroken, whatever do you mean? So detection of it is definitely not 100%. You can't rely on it. And the bottom line is the device is no longer trusted. If the device isn't trusted, how can you trust when you ask it if it's jailbroken? So though some of these, some of these jailbreak detections work, a lot of times I tell people it's just not worth looking at. Focus on making your app so secure that even on a jailbroken device it's still safe. That's, that's really what I, what I recommend. There's also ways that data can unintentionally be retained on a device, even when you don't necessarily think it is. For example, for some time they've had a feature where iOS will store a snapshot of what's on the screen when you leave an application. So if you lock the screen or you jump out to a different app, it'll take a picture of what's there and save it off in that app sandbox. So that when you launch it again, the first thing it does is throw out that image and then it turns away in the background, actually starting the app, bringing stuff back into memory, et cetera, et cetera. But to the user, it looks like it's launching faster. It gives a more seamless experience. The problem is if you had all your bank balances and account numbers on that screen when you locked it, now they're in that image stored away on the disk. Uh, the snapshots are, are fortunately, they're protected by a passcode, so they use the file protection complete. So as soon as you lock the device, you can't read it. But if, if the device isn't unlocked, an attacker might be able to get hold of the device. When it's unlocked, they can then see that, that uh, data and extract it. Uh, in fact, even if the app has all the best protections in the world, all kinds of in-app encryption and in-app password controls and stuff like that, if that's still stored on the screen, then they don't have to launch the app, they just get the data. <clears throat> if you're going to, to hide this data, 
which you should, you need to make sure you do it right. And this is kind of an example of something I saw in an app I reviewed a while ago. I took a picture from a previous presentation of mine and I screened it with black. I basically put an image editor, dragged a big rectangle over it, made it black, but I dialed the opacity down from 100% to 95%. It's, it's black, it's darn black. You can't see a thing there. The one that I saw was a little bit better. I could kind of sort of make out things, but not really. So when I was looking at that, that screenshot, I threw it into preview app and I said, well, okay, maybe if I tweak the brightness, tweak the, the contrast, but what's that button? It's a little button that says auto levels. You push that button and whoop, it all comes right back. You can see it perfectly. And in the case of the app I looked at, I had all kinds of account information, balances, all kinds of things like that, just right there for the taking. They thought they had hit it, they didn't. So if you're gonna obscure it, obscure it with black or replace it with the, the logo for your company or something like that. iOS 6 added some additional features that, that kind of take that screenshot saving to a new level. You can actually save off parts of the UI as UI. It's not just images of, of fields, but it's the actual field objects stored off, stored off uh, you know, serialized or pickled or whatever term you want to use, but saved off onto the disk so that it can come back up more smoothly and you know, pick up where you left off. You can preserve a lot of things, contents of fields and stuff. The bottom line is you need to be careful when you're doing this to make sure you're not, again, saving off data that, that's sensitive that shouldn't be available on the device. So those were sneaky tricks. Those were just the bad. Those weren't the ugly. Here's the ugly things. Uh, passcode brute forcing. For a while, this was, this was definitely a real concern. Again, with the, the DFU boot, you boot off of that, you shell into the device, and you run a program which can brute force the passcode. On an iPhone 3GS, breaking a four-digit passcode would take about 20 minutes or so. The interesting thing is on an iPhone 4 and a 4S and a 5 and all the iPads, the four-digit number takes about 20 minutes because they have a built-in work factor. They, they at least did the password hash correctly where on every device, no matter how fast they make the CPUs underneath it, it still takes the same amount of time per passcode attempt. So, okay, let's just take the hashes off the device and crack it on the GPU cluster. That's what everybody does, right? Well, just like the passcode information for, for breaking or uh, unlocking the device will, is used for, um, use this hardware level device information to, to unlock the keys, you need that same hardware level device information to unlock the passcode. So you can't brute force it. You can't remove a hash and put it on the cluster. You have to break it on the device itself. So brute forcing has to happen on the device. But again, fortunately, on the newest devices, because they've blocked that RAM disk, uh, approach, you, you can't do this yet. I say yet. Somebody's probably going to figure out a way at some point. There are also some forensic attacks you can do. If you get access to an unlocked device and you may not be able to access the files that are well protected, you might be able to look in other things to, to get information like see the, the Wi-Fi networks that they've detected. So you might know where they've gone around and, and visited where they've been. GPS locations, web searches, SMS logs. Uh, there's also been some research uh, a few years ago where people actually looked through the file system journal and were able to recover either whole or partial encryption keys from the file system journal. So even a file that's been deleted or even if it's been wiped, they've been able to go through the disk, find these partial keys, find the blocks to which the keys pertain, use the keys to decrypt those blocks, and now they've got the data back. Even though it was encrypted, those keys were lying around. I'm not sure if Apple's ad addressed that yet or not. This was, like I said, a couple years ago. But I wouldn't be surprised. That ugly attacks like that may still may still be out there. And then finally, while MDM is very useful for managing the devices, there are still some weaknesses in the way that Apple's MDM is, is built. And this kind of goes back to, to the talks I've had before. Uh, basically, the messages from the server to the client aren't signed. So if you can inject yourself into that process, you can tell the client to do whatever you want. Under the right circumstances, you can actually get a client to send unlock keys, to send a key bag back to you. So just like there's a key bag that's stored on your, your PC to do synchronization, there's a key bag that's sent to the uh, MDM server so you can do a remote unlock. So that if your, your device is locked and you call them up and say, hey, I'm locked out, they can, they can clear it. They've got to copy the key bag. Under the right circumstances, you can convince an unlocked device to send you its key bag. And now you just wait till he locks the device again and walks away, send the unlock command, break in the hotel room, open the device, and you've got all the data. Not an easy attack, but at a technical level for a very advanced adversary, it is theirs and something, something to be aware of. So how do you protect your data? I've glossed over a lot of controls and management of, of data. I mentioned data vaults all the time, and I've mentioned a little bit about secure programming. 
we'll go into some, some quick details for, uh, for all these. When somebody asks me, how do I keep my phone safe, uh, family members, companies, whatever, these are, these are the things that usually jump to my mind. Strong passcodes, encrypting your backups, uh, disabling Siri when the device is locked is an interesting one, uh, being able to do remote wipes and locks, and then if you're starting to get paranoid, things like uh, disable creating other accounts and auto-joining of, uh, of Wi-Fi networks. So strong passwords, we talk, talked about that. Generally, I tell the people five to six letters and numbers. It kind of depends. You sort of do the math to get your own comfort level. You certainly don't need a JTFG, you know, 15 character, two characters from each class passcode on your phone. You won't want that. People will shoot you. Um, it's just terrible. But you do want to have something that's reasonably strong. You don't want to stick with the four character passcode because even though the current devices, you can't boot them, you can't do the brute force password cracking, that's not to say that somebody's not going to develop an exploit tomorrow and now all of a sudden all of your devices are at risk. Um, you should also have them auto lock after a couple minutes. The advantage, advantages to this is obviously you increase resistance to brute force attacks and the big advantage is having the passcode enables those data protections, enables the, the encryption of files when the device is locked. If you don't have the passcode, there's nothing to lock them with and they're not protected. The disadvantages, especially when you talk about complex passcodes, they're a pain in the neck. If you get it to lock immediately, as soon as you lock it, then, oh, I gotta look at my mail, okay, oh, I didn't care about that, and lock it, and two, the, two minutes later it buzzes again, you gotta unlock it again. Real pain in the neck, especially if you've got mixed case and punctuations and things like that. And I should mention that I, this, this may be uh, obvious, but I, I guess I should probably mention that brute forcing at the device itself by just punching in codes, that won't work either because after I think five invalid attempts it puts on a one minute delay, the six it adds like a three minute delay, then a five minute delay, then 15, and I think after the seventh or eighth try, it's an hour between tries. And that even preserves through a power off of the device. So if you, you get to an hour, you say, ah, oh, damn it, and you turn it off, you turn it back on, and say, I'm gonna fool you, oh crap, it still won't let me try. So doing it at the device just won't work. When you back the devices up to your PC, you should always have encrypted backups turned on. A couple of reasons for this. If the backup host is compromised, obviously all your data is on that host, so this will make sure that that's, that that's safe. The really good advantage of backing up has, doesn't do so much with the security of the data, but it also, it's more of, for your information, it saves off your keychain. So the keychain where you can store all your device credentials, Wi-Fi passwords, email passwords, et cetera, doesn't get backed up to your PC unless encrypted backups are turned on. So turning that on is, is pretty useful. Um, it also makes extraction of the entire device all at once very difficult because you can't do a backup extraction. Uh, it also prevents things like the new evasion jailbreak. The, that jailbreak works by creating a, a, a uh, maliciously crafted backup and restoring that backup to the phone. Well, it can't create that backup because it doesn't have the ability to encrypt the backup because the encryption actually happens on the device. So encrypting your backups will help prevent things like that, at least for now. Disadvantage to this though, if you forget the password, you can't restore from backup, you're out of luck. You can't even reset the password. It makes you wipe the device and start from scratch. Uh, you may still be able to extract also individual files even when, it, you know, when it's unlocked, even when you have the encryption turned on. So the things that I said before where you can use uh, applications that use the iTunes protocol to extract uh, data, even when the device is locked, locked and you've got, or unlocked, but if, he's, if it's locked and you've got the keys, you can still extract those individual files. You just can't extract the whole thing at once in a backup. Siri when locked. Siri is a fun little thing. I use it for uh, traffic and sending messages and stuff. You can have that enabled at the lock screen so that you can actually pick up a lock phone, hold down home for a few seconds and say, you know, do this, do that, send a message. You can send SMS messages, iMessage, you can post to Twitter and Facebook, things like that. Not necessarily a good thing. You can potentially leak out some data by, by figuring out who the various uh, people are in the contacts if you've asked specific questions well enough. Um, disadvantage of turning this off is now you have to unlock to do any of those things, which could hamper hands for use in a car, uh, just general convenience. A lot of these things, the disadvantage is loss of user convenience. So you're kind of balancing one against the other. Uh, remote controls. Having some kind of remote wipe capability, I think, is, is a very important thing to have uh, for the devices you're responsible for. You can do that through things like Find My iPhone uh, or through MDM, but MDM is limited to just wiping and locking. Some advantages to this is there's a lost device. You can send a message to it through Find My iPhone. 
Uh, you can geolocate, again, through Find My iPhone without MDM, so you can figure out where the device is. You can also remotely lock it, you can wipe it. Disadvantages here, uh, primarily, the wipe message is guaranteed, and it's not acknowledged. So you send the message, you send the request, it says, okay, I sent it, and then you kind of cross your fingers and hope it worked. Because if it doesn't go through, it doesn't try again, or it certainly doesn't try terribly long. And if it does go through, the device can't wipe itself and then say, okay, I'm done, because once it's wiped, it's rebooted, and it, it doesn't know it was just wiped. It wakes up with amnesia. And of course, what I said before is that the thief can obviously just re remove SIMs, put in a shielded bag, etc. And of course, the other disadvantage is once you've wiped it, to protect the data that's on it, you can't still ping it to figure out where it is and see if you can at least recover the hardware. Once you wipe it, you're, you're washing your hands of it and it's gone. There's a feature that showed up, I believe this was in iOS 5, you have the ability to restrict creation of different accounts on the device. Uh, remember one of the, uh, the simple user mistakes that you can make is accidentally sending something out to the wrong email. This is a useful to help re uh, reduce the, the possibility of that mistake. So the advantage is the user can't accidentally, uh, can't deliberately add their own exfiltration methods. They can't add Gmail, they can't add Hotmail, they can't do things like that. It gives you an additional control over, over the inbound and outbound flow. Disadvantages, again, reduction of the usefulness of the device. Now, users, okay, it's secure, you can't use your email, but, but I can't use my email. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, again, the balancing act. And it only applies to the built-in application. So if you've got a third-party application, you know, you, you can turn off Twitter that's embedded in the iOS, but you can't disable somebody from installing the Twitter app and using Twitter through there unless you disable installing apps altogether. Auto-joining Wi-Fi networks is, is an interesting one. The Wi-Fi keys that are stored in the key keychain are locked until you unlock. So that's one of those, those uh, data protection methods that I talked about before. When you do a fresh boot, you can't access those keys. A network that doesn't have a Wi-Fi protection, a Wi-Fi password on it, doesn't need those. So if the device boots up and it sees a known network in range that doesn't require a password, it'll just go ahead and attach to it. This is important for things like, uh, I was describing the evil maid attack, that requires Wi-Fi connectivity. And if you can't reboot the device to, to start the attack and then immediately connect to a Wi-Fi, you can't do anything. ATT Wi-Fi is a good example. Most iOS devices automatically connect to that. I actually set up an access point in my office once called it ATT Wi-Fi, and I had probably a dozen devices connected to it within an hour. Um, didn't do anything with it, though sometimes I think it'd be fun to put in the little image flipper or something. Uh, the advantage of turning this off is, is the users have a much better awareness of when they're connecting to Wi-Fi. They don't just simply go out in the world and things come through their phone and they're like, oh, hey, I got a message, and don't think about the fact that they're connected to, to un unknown, untrusted networks. It removes that easy channel for attackers to use for, for attacking it. Disadvantage is, is now you're going to have to do some, some manual attack, attachments. It, it, it makes it harder to use. Uh, what have we got? 13 minutes. Uh, locking down controls, you can, there are some controls you can actually freeze on the device so that the user can't change them. There's a restriction setting in the settings app that can lock them down with a passcode, which is great. That's what I use on all my kids' devices. But it's got to be done manually on the screen. You have to actually get the device in your hand and do things with it. And also, now you've got to keep a list of the passwords with, with your security division. Um, you can also configure configuration profiles to have passwords or simply don't let them remove. But again, if you're installing them over MDM, the user might be able to remove the MDM, which then removes those protected profiles. A nice new feature that just came out, you can actually set an expiration date on configuration profiles. So you can say, this thing's going to expire the 1st of March, or it's going to expire after six weeks. So you can give someone temporary access to corporate assets and know that they'll go away eventually, you know, go away after a certain point, which is really good. But you've got to be sure that the user is aware of that, because they might be in deep in the middle of the project that got extended, and all of a sudden, crap, I can't access the things I need to do my job. Now you've got to go back and re-enable it. It's a pain. So you've got to keep on top of it when you do that. All right, mobile device management. What are some good settings for that? We've talked about the advantages of this. You can push out configurations to all the devices at once. Uh, there are some additional controls available through MDM that you can't get on the device itself. Disadvantages, you can't do the geolocation, you can't send messages, and as, as I've alluded to before a couple of times, it's not a high integrity protocol. But that said, there's still some things that I think are, are, are useful, some settings that are sort of best practices. 
you can request signed messages. This doesn't sign the message from the server to the client, but it does sign the message from the client back to the server. Adds a little bit of overhead, but it helps to reduce the possibility for the spoofed responses where you know you kind of set up this crazy system to tell them you're you're actually compliant just so you can keep the bad app on your app on your phone. Again, the user can't be prevented from withdrawing, but you can set make a setting so that the server is at least alerted when it happens. If it's not alerted, then they kind of infer that the user is no longer uh, connected because they're no longer getting the updates. But with this, then it will, it will at least try to connect. But it's not a forced connect. If it tries to connect and it can't get out there, then it's going to say, okay, I, I tried to tell them, oh, you're, you're out now. Uh, also, if you can, uh, you should require authentication for enrollment to keep outsiders from joining their devices to your network and possibly getting access to some of your profiles. Um, might reduce the risk of some of the more advanced attacks. Exactly how that works will depend a lot on the MDM vendor uh, that pr provided your server. Some of the recommended controls, those were all describing the MDM configuration, con you know, configuring to the, the MDM connection to the device. Some actual controls that you can send out through MDM. The big thing is, is use it to configure corporate connectivity. You, you, you get a profile to actually install them on MDM, then you send out other profiles to configure all these other things. You can send out the Wi-Fi settings, on-demand VPN for corporate assets. Uh, if you really uh, want to try hard, you can, you can do certificate-based authentication so that all those things uh, are required more than just simply a password. Um, I've talked about removing uh, uh, the profile. They lose the access to all those profiles, so they then lose the, ac lose the uh, access to the to the uh, corporate assets. You can also do things like prevent the user from accepting an untrusted TLS, so they, they won't get the little panel that says uh, accept or, or ignore. Um, you can disable the photo stream, iCloud, you can force encrypted backups. There's also supervised mode, which came out with this application, came out last year called Configurator, which is a way to make the devices even less personal. As I said before, the philosophy seems to have been it's a personal device even when it's corporate owned. Configurator says, okay, screw that. It's a corporate device. It's part of this pool. Um, you get very strong controls over it. You can only sync those devices to the, device, to the system that is the supervisor. You can't take it to any other corporate device and sync. It just won't work. Um, you can force consistent baselines across devices. You can hook up 10 of them at once, the same USB chain, and, and build 10 devices all at once. Uh, some disadvantages, app installs are more complicated. You have to use a volume purchase program, which isn't easy to get into. You have to have certain hoops, um, DON numbers, I think, stuff like that. Uh, the controls are maybe too strong for easy management, like I said, especially in terms of syncing just to specific machines. This is really designed for a pool of devices. Now, this might be good if you've got a pool of a dozen or so things that you give to people when they travel, but I think it would be very hard to use this at, at, at scale for an enterprise. But in supervised mode, there are some nice things that you don't have otherwise. You can force a global proxy for HTTP, so all the web traffic goes through that proxy. But that's not guaranteed if your apps will open up direct socket level communications on their own. You can disable things like Game Center, iMessage. You can also disable the user installing profiles, which is a nice way to turn off the attack we saw yesterday where they were installing uh, ransomware through configuration profiles. This would make that not possible because the user couldn't install it. Unfortunately, that's only available in supervised mode. There's no other way to turn that off. You can also lock the device to a specific application. So it, you, you turn on the device and there's an app there. You turn it off, turn it on, the app's still there. You, you hit home, you can't get out of it. it. It turns it into a kiosk mode, which is kind of interesting in, in certain environments, like maybe a restaurant or something for menuing. All that is great, but there are still some things you just can't do. And there are some things that you can only change locally. When I talked about disabling the creation of new email accounts, you can only do that locally under restrictions. So we're back to an IT guy has to physically hold it, has to physically set that up, has to record the password, has to put it in a database so they can undo it later. Um, there's a picture frame mode which lets you look through sort of a slideshow when the device is locked. If you've got sensitive information on that slideshow, sooner or later it's going to show up on the screen when the device is locked. So you might want to turn that off. The way you turn that off is you go into settings under passcode and change it. That's not configurable in MDM or any kind of configuration profile. So the user can always re-enable it. And you have the same thing for disabling message replies when locked as far as uh, replying to SMS messages. And there are some things that just don't exist. You cannot turn off the microphone in software. And this is interesting. When I, when I first tested this, I installed a voice recording app on an iPad, started it running, closed the cover, set it on my desk, and it recorded clear enough to hear a phone conversation that happened I was in a cubicle, outside the cubicle, past a conference room table, down the hall, and into somebody else's office. And I recorded that whole conversation just fine. 
So you can imagine setting that up, closing the cover, walk in, sit it down on the conference room table, never touch it. You've just recorded the entire conversation. Nobody will know because there's nothing on the device to show you're recording. You can't disable Wi-Fi under the networking. Uh, you can't disable social networking or anything else that's opening up their own uh, network communications. You can't force membership in MDM. So there's, there's still some things out there, some restrictions that you just simply can't get around at this time. I've mentioned data faults. That's basically where you say to hell with the bundled apps, we'll just put everything in something that we trust. Gives you a very high level of control, very strong assurances that your data is all in one place. You're not using the iOS mail, you're not using iOS calendar, you're not using any of these things that other apps can touch. Disadvantages, you've got an additional infrastructure. Somewhere you've got a server that you're talking to. Uh, you've lost that integration with other apps. I mean, in some ways that, that's what you wanted. That's the whole point you got it. But then the whole point of having this device is so you can do lots of things you may not understand, uh, may not have anticipated, you lose all that kind of utility. But if you're looking for something like this, you know, obviously they're, they're almost always going to have dedicated servers and crypto network con connectivity. You're looking for things that have integrated email and contacts and web browsers, file browser management, document viewers, isolate the documents so you can't send them out of the vault in any way, um, remote management of the application and its data so you can actually turn, turn the access off remotely, lock people out. Uh, it'd be nice if you could even have some kind of DRM so the documents just disappear from their, their system altogether or if they find a way to extract the document, it can't be read on another device because it's tied to that device. And obviously all these have to be secured with a strong password. But you have to be sure it's really a vault. I actually looked at a document viewer recently, supported multiple passwords. Uh, you could have a password at the application level when you launch it, have a password at the file level when you read individual files, but then only restricted access to those files within the context of the application. It didn't encrypt anything on the disk beyond what iOS provided in the file protection API. So I could actually, even while that, device, that program wasn't running, I could actually hook up the unlocked device to my laptop, extract the documents just fine. To be fair, the, this application explained all that very clearly in very good language. I was impressed. It explained very clearly in the documentation, but nobody's going to read that. And when you get this thing, you see a password, you think, oh, I'm safe, but you're not. So these things, you still have to go through a vetting process to really understand what they do. Some real fast, quick tips on programming. This could fill a multiple day course, uh, but there are some, some simple things that you should, can do if you're developing apps for your enterprise. First thing is to make sure you're validating data that's coming into the app. Uh, even on mobile apps, you can still have cross-site scripting, you still have SQL injection. Uh, even on the same device, one app can, can SQL inject another app because there's a way to do some inter-app communication through custom URL schemes. Uh, you need to restrict the way data can be shared out of your app. I looked at one app that could view PDF documents, it wasn't the same one as before, it was a custom app. And it had a little share button in the corner. I could hit that and it said send to iBooks. I'm like, oh, that's great. So now my highly classified corporate document is now in iBooks. And once I'm in iBooks, I can print it, I can send it to email, I can do all kinds of things with it. So your app is no longer secure because it can share with something else on the device. Also look at secure SSL use, rejecting bad certificates, validate the cert chain. Consider using certificate pinning. If you're writing a mobile device and you own the, device, the, the application on the device, you own the server, you own everything in between. Why don't you cert Pin, pin your certs to that thing. If you own, bo own both ends of the, of the channel, make sure it's as secure as you can possibly make it. Talked about data retention, obscuring the, the screenshots before the app goes in the background. Don't get fancy with fades and clouds and blurs because it can come back. Uh, watch out for the UI protection or UI preservation. Use file protection. It doesn't cost anything at all. It's automatic. It's magic. It's literally a flag you set when you write the file out to disk. And it turns on the file protection complete. And make sure you don't put anything that's sensitive in a file that's not protected. I found user credentials, I found hashed passwords, I found all kinds of things just stored in the preferences file. There's a keychain. Put all those in the keychain and lock them in the keychain with accessible when unlocked. Because then when the device is, is locked, those same data protections apply. And even if you jailbreak the device, even you get into it, you can't access that data because it's encrypted. For really sensitive things, you can also add another flag, this device only, that keeps those things from getting saved out to the uh, device backup even. So the bottom line, what is the risk? If you look at this from the use case, from how are people using the devices, I figure there's a few different use cases to look at. For general use, normal everyday phone use, whatever, iPad, family stuff, you're probably at pretty low risk, if, especially if you do some of the things I've described here. If you have very sensitive corporate information, you've got to take some care. Periodically look at the kinds of data you're, you're putting on there, look at the application that you're using. If you have extremely sensitive information, use it sparingly. No matter how secure you can make this, you can't underestimate a really advanced adversary who's really going to try and get at your data. I've outlined some bizarre things that, that I don't think anybody in the right mind would ever really do, 
but if I'm the head of a massive mega corp, you know, industrial military company, and I want to find out the jet that they're building over there, that might be a way to get it, is that kind of stuff. And especially if you're gonna to travel to risky locations, don't bring your regular device, get a brand new one, strip it down, only put on the apps that you care about. Uh, if you absolutely need email, have an email set up on a different server that only has the stuff, your, you know, people forward you spe special email just for your trip, stuff like that. Execs don't like that, they won't listen to you, but at least you will have tried. <laughs> Never mind. I'm hearing comments from the peanut gallery about which countries I consider risky. I'm not going to go there. Uh, versus the four main threats that we described before, user mistakes, these protections are helpful. Uh, you still need good user education, good configuration management. Deliberate attacks uh, from the unauthorized user, you're still going to get it. Third party systems, the silos will help. But even then, the user still knows the password. If they really, really want to get at this, they can jailbreak the device, they can disassemble the program, they can understand how it works, they can figure out how to take their password, apply it to the pro programs that are secured in there, and extract the data. In casual crime, lost at a coffee shop, you're fine. Like I said, they're probably just going to wipe it. But really advanced attackers, there's still some risk. Attacks are getting more difficult, but it's there. So predicting the future, I don't think it's a, a stretch to say jailbreaking is going to keep getting harder, the vulnerabilities will get more difficult. Um, it's hard to assess what's out there in the App Store because you don't know. That's constantly changing. That's probably the biggest unknown is the App Store. But I still think the biggest real danger is the device users, making sure that they can't extract data. So you want to look at applications, look at things that protect the data even from your own people. That's, that's the biggest thing there, especially when you talk about deliberate exfiltration. And I've got a couple of slides of references, but you can get those once it's been posted. So, any questions? I think we're running out of time. Yes. On the uh, couple of slides ago, you commented uh, advanced hackers uh, are getting more difficult. How do you the risk, the current level of risk, compare to a reasonably well secure laptop running a popular It's interesting. I, the, the question, it's actually interesting because I had thought of that question myself uh, a while ago. How does the risk level on a mobile device like an iOS device compared to a comparable modern laptop. And in some ways, I think it's probably more secure because laptops, there's a lot more things you can do. You can generally, you can extract the drives. You can try and boot them off of different things. You can boot off a USB stick more readily. Just, just at the boot level attacks, a lot of those have gone away for the iOS devices. They're still certainly present in desktops now, or laptops. Now, obviously, you can do full disk encryption and things like that, but again, you've got these evil made kinds of attacks that, that can maybe get through those. So again, if you're talking advanced level, it's harder. Much larger quantity of applications and data on laptops. It, it's a tough question, but I feel more comfortable with the limited capabilities of uh, mobile devices with data on those. I feel more comfortable with those than I do with putting very sensitive information on laptops. But obviously, in both cases, you have to be careful. I'm about to get kicked off. Any other quick questions? All right. Thank you very much.